Uh, thanks, everybody. For... Cool. And you guys are fans if it gets hot in here, because it always does. Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. Thanks, everybody, for coming this week. And I apologize <laughs> for not being there in person. So I am going to try to do this remotely. Um, our guest speakers this week, we have Stacy Snively and Kevin Hudaba. Uh, we're both going to talk about their Airbnb properties. Okay. Um, I do not know if Kevin's going to join us sure. or not. If not, and we have some time, I may uh, talk about my Airbnb properties a little yeah. bit. Yeah. So we will definitely, we've got content. We just, um, we've got plenty of content. We just may modify it a little bit. So Stacy, if, um, so Stacy bought, you've got three Airbnb properties now. Is that correct? Yeah, I just have something printed. Um, I have. Hi. Hello. Oh, hey, Kevin. Hey, there you are. Nice to do. Yeah, uh, join us. Cares? You like to do? Where are you? I, I had to get some lunch. I wasn't going to eat cupcakes for lunch. Sorry. <laughs> 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 sure. <laughs> so yeah, we've got um, Kevin Hudaba and Stacy Snively. Both are a uh, Airbnb experts, and uh, they're going to share a little bit about both of their properties. They both, I believe, have three properties. Is that right, Stacy and Kevin? Yeah. So hopefully they're going to share some numbers, tell us the good, uh, tell us the bad. I, I, I think everyone always talks about the good, but there's definitely um, some not so good all the time uh, with these properties. So hopefully they'll share some good and some bad and some financials. And um, yeah, if uh, Stacy, if you want to go first, tell us a little bit about yourself, um, your real estate investments um and your real estate business and a little bit more about yourself and then tell us about your properties okay i kind of i uh, guess happened into the airbnb with my brother my brother lives um an hour and a half two hours north of here on a really small lake so i mean when i say small it's like 50 acre lake right and it's idle speed only there's no speed boats nothing and um He's single, never married, and he was living in this big house and decided he'd try to like rent it out on Airbnb. My parents thought he was nuts because we're literally in the middle of like nowhere. <laughs> and um, shockingly, he just started getting hunts. Now, granted, COVID, right, was a really big boost to Airbnbs, and people were like staying local. They wanted houses by themselves versus hotels. So, like, timing wise, everything's been even my numbers, I feel like, last year and a half are different than like maybe what they will be. Um, but Ryan, he's, he has four now. Um, and the, the lake was a huge draw, right? And even though it was idle speed, even though it was in the middle of nowhere, there's no towns around, the little town growing in, which is like a thousand people, right? Um, he was getting a ton of people from Chicago, mm -hmm. like that, because the Lake Michigan prices just got overinflated, like crazy expensive to go and stay on Lake Michigan. Um, so they just started looking further and further out. And then they get out there and they're like, this is beautiful, right? We're out in the middle of nowhere and it's nature and you can kayak and you can paddleboard and your kids can swim and not like worry about a speedboat. Um, so Ryan grew one into two into three and four. Um, we were, I was just talking with Mary and like a big thing for him that's probably different than mine, but like one of his houses, it was built in the fifties, but it's like, it's so strange, but it has an indoor pool and that sucker books year round because of this indoor pool. Mm -hmm. um, hot tubs, people love hot tubs too. Mm -hmm. Like hot tubs and pools, like they, those are like really big attractions. Um, but so yeah, so he's had really good luck with his. And so I was like, I want to, do one of these and I kept thinking at first I was like oh like I felt like I had to be at the lake and um then I don't know it jokingly I have three kiddos and we've done travel sports for a long time and so we spend a lot of time at Grand Park and we would always joke about oh wouldn't it be great if we had some more like, place to like hang out and we were spoiled considering we we're only like 15 minutes from home and most of these people were like you know staying in a hotel or whatever um, so I stumbled across in 2020, a property on Spring Mill and 191st Street. Um, it was 4th of July weekend and we've been on the market for three years and it was six acres with a house and a barn on the six acres. Um, talked my husband into it and I was going to do the whole sports thing. Thank God I did it. Um, 
but the ranch house sleeps 10. It has three bedrooms. It has a king size bed, a queen size bed, two sets of bunk beds, and a block couch. Uh, and like I said, the property is six acres, which I've learned is good and bad. Um, the maintenance. barn maintenance. <laughs> I mean, and I'm not an expert. I am learning as we go. Like, I'm kind of my personality. I kind of jump in and then be like, okay. No, she's an expert. We're, we're, we're all in training. I'm, I'm looking. <laughs> Um, I'm an expert in learning as I go. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yes. I mean, and my husband is not like he's an attorney. So he wants to know all the things up front. He thinks of all the things that are gonna go bad. I'm like, you are such a buzzkill. Like, <laughs> why are you so negative? That is my job. <laughs> right? Like all I do all day is think of like, well, this could happen. Well, it could not happen. Um so anyways, the barn I turned into a party barn, basically. I am from Wabash. Um, <laughs> and it's, so it's a big open area. It has a kitchen and um, it has bunk rooms in there, full bathroom, full laundry room. Um, Grand Park. So Grand Park, a lot of people think, oh, Grand Park, and me included. This is on me not doing all my research before jumping in. Grand Park is stay play, meaning like you have to stay through them in order to play in their tournaments. So um, the way that they book is through like, it's all about money, right? It's all about the kickbacks. So Grand Park gets a kickback from hotels as they send <laughs> thousands of people to these hotels every year, right? Um, I am on something called Rent Like a Champion, which is approved play play. So I am approved to be a part of this system, but it is just not like all the teams that I talked to, they're like, what is that? I haven't heard of that. Like, I think it's just easier for like, it's called site search to just push a hotel, right? Um, like today, I just got an inquiry for the timeout and it was baseball team. Hey, you know, because yeah. there are hundreds of teams coming. Hundreds. Some, sometimes there's over 100 teams for one tournament. It's crazy. It's there's insane. so many people coming. So many people. And I part of me wants to go to the town of Westfield because I'm like, we're all a part of this and Westfield owns this and I own land in this yeah. town. Like, I should have the same access to like these people as a hotel does because mm -hmm. they're booking hotels outside of Westfield, typically, right? Yeah. Um, but I have gone in circles and circles with site search. I haven't given up yet. Um, so the whole thing of me thinking I was going to get teams totally did not happen. I am getting people that want to book for family reunions. Um, they had celebrations of life, grad parties, and wedding galore. Um, I but, called Westfield and I was, because I was like, how can I just be a wedding venue? I take way more money. Um, that is a change in zoning, and I don't want to go down that path because then they can say no, and then I would not have my wedding business. Right. So basically, what you do in an Airbnb is like people show up, and if they decide to get married, so be it, right? right? But I am not getting paid for alcohol. I'm not getting paid for you know anything outside of providing accommodations. Do I charge more if more people show up? Yes. Um, so like for a wedding weekend, you know, I'm charging almost six grand. Wow. But they're bringing a hundred people. I have tables and chairs for a hundred people. Mm -hmm. Um, that's more wear and tear on the property, the more people you have. Um, but for a bride, it's hell of a deal. They get to sleep 16 people, right? For two nights. They get to bring in their own food, their own alcohol. Like they get to bring in all their own stuff. So it's. It's, you know, they can have the rehearsal dinner there, they can have the wedding there, like they are making, it's a deal for them as well. Um, yes, like we don't need to prepare, right? Um, and really it's going to come down to like what Westfield told me, you know, you got to be careful how many questions you ask, but like, it's like anything else. If there is noise or traffic complaints, that's when they're probably going to come to me and be like, okay, <laughs> what kind of rage are you taking here? A hundred cars to the park. No, and I don't know. A hundred people. hundred people. People will be like, oh, 125. And I said, I have to have a hard number. Like, at some point, you just have to say, okay. Because everybody's going to try to push that a little bit. So I'm, And even though it sucks to give it up sometimes, I'm like, no, it's 100, right? Um, so... Yeah, the pros and the cons of that are yeah, what to be it. So gross numbers last year, not very good TNL because they are people. 
Well, I prefer like if you think a hundred people. I mean, I've had I've had my own parties out there too, which is a huge awesome thing I get to do. So I'll do a client vacation, friends, whatever. I had probably over two hundred people out there. You have people show up in Ubers. You have people come together, and then I have like a parking area. Um, like they never end up. I've not had parking either. Yeah. Either my party. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. For my party, I've not had any like, and that's like a ton more people than what I allow uh, for other people. Um, numbers are tricky. Not tricky. Um, <laughs> there's like everyone's while there might be a Venmo or something, right? Um, so yes, mine is like a lot of like people word of mouth has gotten out. Um, gross numbers, I did about 120,000 last year. Sounds great, not as great as it probably sounds. Um, <laughs> because I have a lot of overhead, right? So with this property, uh, Angie ran numbers this morning. So we do monthly expenses without like, let's say nothing else, but like the utilities and the property management and mowing the grass. It's fifty one hundred dollars, right? And that's with my, you know, my mortgage payment with principal and interest. I always feel like principal is kind of like putting it back into my savings account. So, you know, my husband and I go and purchase that one. I'm like, no, that comes back to me. Mm -hmm. Um, but so it's fifty one hundred. So you've got one hundred twenty thousand. But then there's expenses when you have people there, right? Last year I netted around twenty thousand dollars. There's a lot of flop in that as well, though. You know, if I need to buy furniture for the house. There might be some expenses that happen, right? Um, we also had some big expenses last year. I re I have a problem of over improving the property that I own. Um, just by like it was really nice. I spent like seven grand to get like the floors refinished. Did they need refinished? Probably not. They look nice, you know. Um, I did have the HVAC system go out of the house last year. That was eight thousand dollars. Um, and I'm still adding stuff. Like I bought a $1,200 television that's up in the corner. I bought like more tables and chairs, right? And those were a few thousand dollars. So like net, that was my first full year with last year. So I figure like net 20 last year, I would say my total investment in the property, I owe 367 on it. Um, <coughs> my acquisition cost was 480. But I probably have 600 in the whole property, considering like what I put into the barn. I put quite a bit. So if I say 600, I always think like, uh, I'm like, I am not like, we do things in simple terms. And I talked to an investor one time, I'm like, how do you like, what do you consider like a really good return? He's like, you take the cost of something and he pays cash for everything, right? So he doesn't have all these other expenses. So if you take the cost of something, you take $600,000, you can make 10. 10% a month, that's really good. So that's my new, like what I want to get to is the goal. If I could get to netting 6,000 per month, right? That would be a great investment. Um, next year, I should not have these big expenses that I've had the last year, because this was my first full year of operation. Yeah. And I learned so the first year or the first few months, you have higher expenses because so you hear from guests and you're like, yeah. oh. oh, there's there's a water issue or there's a, you know, a washing machine yeah. issue. And you're like, OK, replacing the water yes. here, replacing the washer and dryer because it's essential. And don't you think I think I've learned in my brother's so like, like out the gate, do it all nice and do it all new. Yeah. Because otherwise it's you're going to have these like little things that come up constantly, you know. Granite, as much as it gets cost, it's much easier to take care of, right? Like, do the things up front. And my properties are all like minus the overtime, and it's fucking wind right now. The other one, I'll talk about that one later. But um, my one in Zionville and this one, like, they're good, like, property value too. I mean, I paid 600 for that. Lancaster, they're selling houses in there for 500. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so many houses. I'm like, I've got six acres, a barn, and a house, right? So even like, the appreciation of my investment itself, right? Mm -hmm. um, I get that paid off in a few years and then I don't have those expenses, you know? So I think for me, it's more of it's a long game than it is like a short game. Thank you. Can you say that again? The long game versus, can you say that again? The long game? It's long game versus the short game for me. Like, yes. Love it. Love it. And that's, Love the, it. that's the name of the game with rentals. Uh -huh. Like you have to be in it for the long term because 
you know, it's not just about getting one year of cash flow and then selling it. It's right. like you bought in A class locations because you want the long term appreciation yes. for those properties. You know, and I think that's a big difference with short term rentals versus a lot of people that buy long term rentals, mm -hmm. right? Their goal is to get the cash flow. So they might buy in shit areas. They get no appreciation, but their goal is to get that $300 a month cash flow. And, you know, they have extra risk with terrible tenants. Yeah. You know, the difference between short term and long term <clears throat> is that we have high turnover but also people aren't staying there for five years and trashing the place, you know? I, and James probably knows this too. I don't know. Do you do long-term rentals too, James? I have one long-term rental and it's getting ready to get turned to a short-term here in about two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I know a lot of investors that, that own long-term rentals and their biz, biggest expense of operation is turnover. Not, not just vacancy, but... Every time they, they they have a tenant in there for two, three years, they're spending $8,000 to do all new flooring, all new appliances, mm -hmm. all new paint versus us that have just short-term guests. They're not trashing the place. I mean, we you see know? it every and, week. Yeah, so exactly. You're so you, it you're, constantly. you're turning it yeah. over. If there's an issue, you're taking care of it right, right. away versus something that's been there for a long time. So, so um, because we do have um, long-term since five years, we have long term rentals. Really? I totally agree with you, Kevin. Yeah. Uh, but uh, I mean, we also charge the tenants who live there for whatever um, things they did in the house. Yeah. So it goes into, but it's only so that that it's hard to be hard to collect yeah. on that. Though. Yes. Yeah. And if it is like the, the security deposit is only 2000 and there is like you need to change the whole carpet, and that's not going to come up. Yeah. But, yeah, then we have to do the best thing. Yeah. yeah. Can you guys? Adrenaline junkie thing, too. I'm more of an adrenaline junkie. It's fun. It's, I hear the bling on my phone. I'm like, oh, Airbnb is on a Like, it's like, <laughs> I, I get my own, like, messages. Right? I know James has a property management. And I'm like, oh, but you missed out on this glorious sound. It's so nice. <laughs> <laughs> I can just hear it. I'm like, oh, I am an adrenaline junkie, and like this is more of like long term. I'd be like, oh my god, I went back in. Like it's just boring. Mm -hmm. I'm like, oh no, I like I like the thrill of it. And like, well, and as people, real estate but... agents, we're used to the variable income, so that doesn't scare us no. as much. And it also, like, it can be a complement of your real estate business, right? Like, I use mine for parties. Um, my, I know, and I spend a significant amount of money on my parties, right? but that's fun. And that's part of the way I work, right? It's to share yeah. it with other people and do things. But um, <laughs> like the one in Zionville, like I, like I can like take, I had clients that moved from one location and I put them in here for a few months, right? Mm -hmm. Like, or even a few days, like be like, hey, like I got this for you. So it's like, it gives me like almost like an advantage mm -hmm. And, you know, I met with a builder the other day. I'm like, well, you know, we work something out. Like, you know, give me a heads up on when your, like, delivery date is. I'll block off two weeks. If you're running a little over, I got you, right? Mm -hmm. Like, it just, there's, like, different ways of utilizing it that aren't totally monetized by, like, a P&L mm -hmm. that you can use for, like, your other business, right? It all kind of works together versus it being kind of black and white. I'm not very black and white anyway, so, right? Mm -hmm. But yeah, it's fun. The one in Zionville, kind of the same thing. I bought in 21, which is weird because 20, was it 20? No, 21, which is weird because 21 was like a crazy year, right? But in Zionville, for some reason, yeah. the house in the village, it's on Oak Street and it's next to like an office building. Again, it sat and sat and sat, expired, sat, expired. Finally, I told him, I'm like, can you sign this contract? And he's like, what are you buying? <laughs> I had it for like 250000 nice. four blocks really in the village, right? Um, I put a ton of money in it, right? But it is, I love it. It's emotionally attached. Mm -hmm. But like, um, this is our first, like, so I had that one, I had clients in it till December. I had some bookings in December, January, February sucked. And then for everybody. Um, yes, for everybody. Yeah. And then I think I brought it in December. Well, it's just 
He wants to be in Indiana for one. People, but, people um, are traveling for the holidays, Christmas, New Year's, and then January, February are, are kind of, right. you know, the weather's crap here and there's not a whole lot of holidays bringing people to Canada. Right. You know, not a lot of March, March, yeah. April, things start getting hit. Yeah. So, so yeah, let, me ask, let me ask you this. What tax benefits have you realized as a result of owning these properties? No, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not good at that. Have you done like a cost segregation analysis or something? And... <laughs> yeah, I'm not. I'm not the numbers one. Yes, the accountants this year. We like I said. I there. This was our first full year of one of them. Time out was this 22 was the first full year I had it open because I bought it in 20 renovated it for most of the rest of the year of 20 into 21 but barn didn't open till summer of 21 so 22 is our first full year mm -hmm. uh, i don't even know what those words mean well and, and because <laughs> and because you know, we all have real estate licenses we can do things that other people can't right you know if you're if this is a full-time career for you and you can prove that to the irs then you can do it like deduct things off of this, you know, like a cost segregation analysis, which is where you basically depreciate different facets of the house oh. and deduct that from your your taxes. I mean, we deduct it from the taxes of the the, the time out itself. Like we have depreciation schedules, mm -hmm. right? Because we did a lot of improvements, and so there's depreciation schedules on like all the big things that I did. Mm -hmm. um, but I mean. Keep that one recorded. I feel like I'm gonna get audited. Um, <laughs> <laughs> this just goes, yeah, just goes. Yeah, I'm just go. Yeah, just go. Yeah, I'm with you right there. I've never bought Airbnb ride in 25 years. <laughs> Once a while, they go into things like this. So it's hard to look at my PL and be like, oh, oh. I mean, like what I'm going to report versus what I. That's part of the beauty of. But yeah. Oh, every, everybody invests in real estate for different reasons, <laughs> right? And, you know, Stacy and I, I think we have a similar philosophy that we would rather buy in A class locations, mm -hmm. high appreciation areas. And the cash flow is really just about if I could break even or do a little better, we're good. Right. If I own this property for five years or seven years or whatever it is, that's going to be a huge gain. Yeah. And over that time, we're going to get principal pay down yeah. um, and interest deductions. So that's yeah. your tax benefit there. But it's really not about pulling out. The cash flow. I don't know about you, but I I leave reserves and cash flow in the account for maintenance or whatever. Right. You know, so it's really How much just do you put generally for your properties. Is there like a percentage or a dollar for, amount for my reserves? Yeah. Yeah. What well, what what do you anticipate for a sinking fund for uh, one of one of your Airbnbs? Well, so for for me for for my real estate sales business as well as each of my rentals, I I put a four month reserved for for expenses which like we're never going to be vacant 100 percent for four months but it's just in in case of repairs and and vacancy i know that i can make the mortgage and it's fine so like oak street this was like my i think it was like my first month and i've gotten i brought magazines like i had a written up in the boom kind of and i lobbied for this like wrong one <laughs> but um like so, yeah, yeah. Um, wanted to be on the cover, but I was like, oh, I don't want to pay for that. <laughs> um, so like we are gonna do. God, I didn't bring my readers either. Six thousand two hundred fifty-five gross at Little Oak this month for April. Nice, right? Um, nice. Fifty-five, and then I asked Angie today. I'm like, what are my like expenses? If nobody was there, like, if I just had to pay for the mortgage. The utilities just keep everything going. That's twenty six hundred. Mm -hmm. So like that's a pretty good swing in one yeah. month, right? Yeah. So and it's just yeah. now picking up. That one's going to be totally different, and that's where I think that's in Henderson, Zinesville, Zinesville. Mm -hmm. oh, where 
Yeah. Oh, the and, same, same one? Same yeah. Same and that's like, like I got random stuff. Like, like Jenny this morning, my marketing person was like, well, who's renting it? And I was like, well, I had a dad last Friday that rented it for his daughter's 12th birthday. She wanted to stay in her candy. Sweet. Um, <laughs> I have a, a grandmother-to-be who rented it for 16 nights. Her daughter's going to have a baby and she wants to be in town for it. And I was like, oh, best mother-in-law ever. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, like, yes. <laughs> right? So do you have minimum, like, what, what's your minimum stay? So at the time out, I did do it two, like the summer at three and then regular at two. Yeah. Oak Street, I had a minimum of two and I kept having people ask me. So it's only one right now. But like the guy was willing to pay the cleaning fee. I mean, I was like, that's expensive. He paid almost $800 to stay there for one night. Wow. Right? With taxes and the cleaning and the. What do you charge for cleaning fee for your son, your uh, village house? 150. That's pretty normal. People accept that. Yeah. And I probably pay, like, I have like super duper good cleaning people. So I'm probably paying more than that actually after one clean. But like cleanliness is like this, the live on oak is more like boutique. I supply like, you know, that labeled. Um, you know, shampoo, conditioner, soap. I've got like notepad. I have coffee cups that have my logo on it. Like it is boutique. Like mm -hmm. I wanted it to be like a different experience to be like, this is like what you're going to get, right? Versus staying on Brick Street for 250 bucks a night and you get a bedroom, right? So if you could stay here and pay 600 a night for eight people and you get an entire house, then the same like rocket science, right? Like, so what? Are, so what are the fees? If someone books. What they, they pay your they pay your nightly fee, mm -hmm. whatever whatever fee. So you have your cleaning fee, taxes, taxes, and then how do you handle that? Because you have to pay Airbnb, Airbnb. pulls it they do. from from the the guest. Yeah. So so the the guest, you know, what we get as a host and what the guest pays is different. So they have the nightly rate and the cleaning fee. You have a pet fee, you know, they'll pay that. But then Airbnb charge a guest service fee and occupancy taxes. It ends up being like 30%. It's it's a lot. Between yeah. taxes and Airbnb. So at as a host, we're only paying three percent of what we get, but the guest is paying the Airbnb fee and taxes, which amounts to a lot. So the guest is paying. Airbnb the most amount of money. The the host is not paying very much. Three percent of three fucking three percent. Yeah. Is all paid on, on Airbnb, VRBO it's like eight percent. Right. If you guys want, I can pull up um on my Airbnb account. I can share my screen. Yep. So people can kind of see what oh, okay. well, let me uh share my screen. Can you guys hear me okay? Yeah, I'm gonna make sure you can share your screen. Yeah. Absolutely. Airbnb, if I make a thousand bucks, they're going to take three percent from that. But they're charging the customer, like if it's a thousand dollars, it's almost 15 percent in taxes, which is the same tax you pay at a hotel. Hey, James, so you should be able to share. Taxes. And then it's another 15 percent that Airbnb charges. Yeah. Oh. So they're so charging they're paying 1300. The guest is paying 13. Almost 30 percent. Plus, yeah. In Airbnb, the, all those fees are based after a cleaning fee, too. I'm like, well, that's kind of crappy. Um, yeah. But I just this month have launched my own draft booking site. So I went through something called Owner Res. Mm -hmm. And mainly because I was getting so many people that wanted to book outside of Airbnb to like save that extra 15%. Yeah. But then it became like a tracking nightmare. Um, just because they were paying me in all different ways. And that's where I got all this money last year that was sort of like all over mm -hmm. the place because they were paying multiple calendar reservations, right? Yeah, but that's easy because I could just block it. I could block Airbnb directly. But I it just became really hard to manage. And you know, and then I was like, okay, even though they're friends of mine, someone has signed like a contract, like if something happens, right? Like I felt like it was too loosey goosey. Right. Like, yeah. Um so we did our own direct booking site and it's called All Good Night. And then they can, it coordinates with all of them. So I'm on VRBO and Airbnb and my own direct booking site. So I'm on three different sites, but they all coordinate together and talk to each other. So calendars will block whether or not any of those platforms are on. So all three will block. 
Can you guys see my screen now? Yes. Yeah. yeah. There you go. So you said it pulls from all good nights, pulls from VRBO and Airbnb. So and you can, them. it's a master calendar yep. that these feed into. And you can book directly from there and save the fees from yeah. those sites. Which is what I, yeah. yeah. So it makes it like, <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah, so they just makes it so that the people that are local, I feel like I'm bringing in that business, then, right? I shouldn't, Airbnb shouldn't make money off of that if I'm the one that procures the Right. So how do you promote all the nights? Right now it's just been social media, the Boone County magazine. I just started it, right? And like um locally if somebody books it, and then you know, we get phone numbers after every booking. Mm -hmm. So now I told Jenny, I was like, I want like an automated message because I can do that through owner reds because they collect that data. It's hard to go back and get it from Airbnb because it expires, but you get phone numbers. So now I'm like, okay, after every reservation. Send them like a thank you for staying. If next time you'd like to book directly, you can book through this booking site. And here's a promo code. I can do yeah, promo code. That's awesome. Yeah. And so then they're going to come directly to me. And not only that, then they see all my other properties, right? Yeah. They're not just seeing the time out or Oak Street. They get to see everything. Yeah. And then the goal would be is like maybe eventually I could have our own property management company where I could have other people mm -hmm. add their properties onto my website and then I collect fees from that. Yeah, nice. wow. So, yeah. But it was like, I always say it's all good. We were trying, we just like did like a brainstorming on like naming, and I was like, you know, I'm always like, it's all good. We got it. Somebody's like, maybe we should do that. All good. And then we got the night. So, right. so you said like there is, um, when um, she was asking, um, it's a cleaning fees, taxes. Yeah, so James, James pulled up oh, a, yeah. a reservation on, on his property. Do you want to scroll down to the booking details? Yep. So this is an example of one. Oh, okay. That's yeah. helpful. That shows what the guests paid, and then this shows what we get. Yeah. And any cleaning fee, one point five guest service fee. So that goes to Airbnb. who is this through Airbnb? James. Yeah. This is Airbnb. Okay. And uh, an occupancy occupancy taxes that goes to what the municipality. Correct. Yeah. I have no idea. Airbnb yeah, keeps Airbnb it. collects it. Whatever they do with it, that's on them. <laughs> Out of your hands. Yep. What I like on this example, I get the the 380 for the two nights and I get the 125 cleaning fee. And then they take their three percent out of that. So the guest service fee is something the the renter pays and the occupancy taxes this the renter pays. I don't see that money. I just see the nightly rental money and the cleaning fee, and then I pay my cleaners direct out of that. Yeah. So they're basically taking, so that's a, basically it's a pass through for the cleaning fee to the guests, right? So, so I, 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 up charge my, I upcharge mine a little bit. So my cleaners charge me $100. I charge $125. So I make $25 on the cleaning. All right. Well, I mean, it seems like it's reasonable. Cash flow. Yeah, yeah sure. I have another. And then how quick did you get paid? One next day. Yeah, when when they the day after they check in, you get paid on that. So even if they're staying for a week, you'll get paid the day after they check in. Oh, yep. Okay. And they just me and even are easy to work with. Airbnb is a piece of cake. What did yeah. you say, James? It's a piece. I think it's a piece of cake. You get, you know, we just I did we did professional photos just like we do for a regular listing. Yeah. And then you know you make up make a nice write up, and then it kind of it's on autopilot kind of from there. What happens when they're there and check they check out and the place has been trashed or the house is broken or whatever? You, you want to document everything, so right? So on you so on well, you you maybe. take photos and and you could send the guests a message, and you have to be a little bit sensitive about it because. Within two weeks after they leave, you're in the review period. Mm. So the guest could write up a review for you. I'm always like, let them write the review before you get yeah. early. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So, I mean, you, you might be like, hey, I got this photo from our cleaning person. The, the sheets all have blood on them. You get bloody sheets all the time, right? Oh, like, <laughs> <laughs> like, hey. What what happened? We can't we can't get the blood out or 
hey, there's a stain on the carpet. Do you know what happened? So we could try to get it out, you know? So then like they acknowledge like, oh yeah, we spilled whatever, this and that. And I'll be like, okay, I'm gonna try something else to get this out. And if we're not getting it out, I'll figure out what it's gonna cost to replace. Yeah. And, and then they're acknowledging, okay, I did something that is gonna cost me money. Airbnb offers like an insurance. Yeah, they, they have protection. So like if, if the guest refuses, to pay willingly, Airbnb will cover it and then go after the guests later. But the Airbnb? well, Airbnb covers the host up to a million dollars, supposedly. Should be more against, liability. against damage. Yeah. Is that an application for like your Airbnb business or should you get something else out of it? I I don't know I we I do get a different um, kind of insurance policy that covers like the furniture and income loss in case of disaster also so I think that one's safe like what if like there was a massive flood or like you know whatever you shut it down for like three months, months or, right? or whatever it's a, it's yeah a, is right that a, You're... is that what, a loss of use is that what that's mm -hmm. called okay. yeah yeah so yeah like then you know that's income that you're not making to pay the bills or the mm -hmm. mortgage whatever so yeah i have insurance on that too yeah. and a lot of liability so it's called loss of oh yeah but that what is loss, loss of income, income. Loss of income. Yeah. Do you mind if I chat about you know my my first one? I'm going to use the whiteboard because sometimes it's easier to to be visual. Um, and I'm going to be right behind you, Steve. So. I was like, I picked the wrong so, seat. It's, it's, it's all good. Um, mm -hmm. So so like we talked about, uh, investing always comes down to your financial goals. So for me and for James, I don't know about you, but we also do flips, you know, buying and selling. And so for, for me, that's cash and cash flow, and the rentals are the long term appreciation. So I do a lot of flips to generate cash, and then I'll put it into a long term investment. How many flips do you do a year? Um, so the last year I did four, and this year will be quite a bit more. In December, I bought four properties. And three of them were flips. One of them is a new Airbnb. So um, I'll I'll talk about that in a second. Great, great question. Um, so my first Air, Airbnb is downtown Noblesville. Um, I found this property from a listing appointment. Uh, it was a client of mine that inherited her mom's rental, and she moved out of the area. So the funny thing is that. I told her in advance of the listing appointment, I'd probably sell it for 150000 as is. And then we were walking through, and she was just so disgusted with how the tenants left the property. And she's like, I should really just sell this to an investor. Mm -hmm. like, and I was like, well, if you would take $100,000, i will I'll be your buyer on it. And she was like, OK, let's do it. <laughs> she just didn't want to deal with it anymore. How, and this, okay. this is a past client of mine. Let's stop right there for a second. How do you deal with the conflict of interest with? Well, I, I was up front with her, you know, I and I, I told her, hey, if 100K doesn't work for you, I don't care. I'll list it for whatever you want, 125. So you get around. 150. Yes. Okay, got it. And I like giving people options. Okay. You know, and this is somebody I had a relationship with. So it, it's not about me taking advantage. It's about, you know, being the solution mm -hmm. okay. it's not the money. in that case mm -hmm. yeah it's, it's the like headache. she lives in fort wayne now you know so she's out of the area um the renovation on this renovation and furnishing is about 45 10. um so we're 145 into it and uh after repair value um i think we came in at 240. Wow. wow. So I'm 145 into it for the property worth 240. So 
what's that difference? 95,000 in equity that we created. Um, so what I did actually at the end of last year, um, we did this cash. So my Airbnb side, I partnered with my father-in-law. So we do that together. He's a lot more handy than me. I just buy new deals, right? And, and I manage them. Yeah, we self-manage. Mm -hmm. um, but, but we did this, company. we did this cash. Mm -hmm. You have a property management company? No, just, just self-manage. Okay. Yeah. Um, we did this cash and then at the end of last year, we did a refi mm -hmm. cash out and we were able to get 180,000 refinanced. So now my monthly payment on it is 1,500 a month. I still own the property. So how many times could you do that, right? Buy a property, fix it up for 145, and then take an extra 35,000 out of it. And you still own a property in downtown Noblesville. Um, great location that's gonna appreciate over time, right? The, this is my first rental. So the reason I decided to go was short-term rental versus long-term rental. I was originally thinking long-term rental, but I was looking at rental comps and I was thinking I could probably get 13 to 1400 a month as a long-term rental. And uh, last year we averaged um, 30, 50 a month gross. Wow. So, mm -hmm. wow, over over two times, like two and a half times, wow. what I would get for long term rental. Yeah, we're gonna paying utilities or yeah, cleaning fees, cleaning fees and stuff like that. But yeah, so uh, short term is like less than three months. Like I'm sorry, short term. When you say short term, is it less less than short short term, short -term rental is like Airbnb mm -hmm. rental versus a long term rental that you're gonna have at least year long lease. Okay, and it's all furnished and all ready to go. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um. So, so cash flow after expenses and mortgage. Um, uh, January until today, we've been averaging twelve to fifteen hundred a month. Yeah, yeah, it's really good. So when when a lot of investors are looking to buy a long term rental, usually they're they're looking to cash flow two to three hundred dollars a month. But the problem with that is that you have one major repair item. Um, a furnace goes out, a water heater goes out, there's a plumbing leak, there's a flooring replacement, and it takes up your entire cash flow for the year. Um, the, and the same thing with turnover. Like maybe you're making that two or three hundred dollars a month, but then you have a tenant leave and you have to replace all the carpet and repaint and replace the appliances. And then that $3,000 a month is gone. So the nice thing about this is you have a higher appreciating, appreciating asset. You know, maybe I'll, I'll get that 12 to 1500. Maybe I'll have some expenses, but there's some cushion there if I have to make repairs. And, and also it, for me, this is about financial freedom, right? So how many times do I have to do this to, not have to sell real estate until I'm 90 years old. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe 10. That would be a good start. Where did you source your rebuy from? Um, I I actually did a private loan with an in individual. So uh, that $1,500 a month is an interest only payment. And then I'll have to secure different financing after three years. Okay. Yeah. But and you know, with interest rates high, uh, a lot of lenders are more cautious in their, their loan value. You know, instead of getting an 80% LTV, a lot of these lenders that are looking at short term rentals, they might offer you 65% really? or 55%. Really? Yeah. Yeah. It's hard be, right now. Be, because a, a lot of times they're looking at what you would get if you had to convert this to a long-term rental. Uh -huh. And they're using that to cover the debt service. And then they're saying, hey, um, if we're at 55% LTV, 
for your property that's worth 240,000, we'll give you uh, 130,000. You know, and it's like, well, I'm 145 into it. I at least want to get that amount of house. So, you know, I found a private lender willing to finance 80% or whatever that is, 75%. So, uh, and this one we've been running for a year now. So, feel pretty confident in in those numbers and that model. Um, my my second Airbnb, I, I bought a duplex in Cicero on 236th Street. It's a mile east of uh, Meridian. And you know, the goal there is to attract uh, or, or Grand Park guests. So the cool thing with a duplex uh, for a short-term rental is you can rent the full size individually and you can have super listing if somebody wanted to book the entire property. So you can have you know, more people or you could have less people and you can accommodate all of them to kind of maximize the occupancy and, and revenue. Um, so we launched that one in August and you know we're just starting to pick up sync because these platforms are all about the reviews and it, it takes some momentum to get there. Um, and our last one, uh, the one we just launched a few weeks ago is downtown. Uh, 21st and Carrollton. Um, that one is a, another A class location surrounded by new construction property selling for $700,000 to $800,000. Um, it was listed, this is a fun one, it was listed for $400,000. And then I bought it from a wholesaler for $290,000. Wow. <laughs> and it was previously an Airbnb, so it was pretty nice, nice and fixed up. Um, we invested 15K in, in repairs and 25K in furnishing. So what I'm uh, 330 into it. And then ARV, we're worth, I, I think we're worth somewhere around 450. Wow. Ooh, that's really good. So I, I financed this with a private lender, and then I, I'm hoping to refi out um, of that lender and, and get at least 400, um, I don't know, 380 to 400, whatever. But either way, we'll be able to, to cash out that type of lender that we're in on. So, so that's another one. You know, we're surrounded by new construction worth seven to 800,000. And this four hundred and fifty thousand dollar property, just like your Zionsville, like in three to five years, I can see us getting six hundred thousand out of it. You know, so as long as we're cash flow positive on the rental, and that's like ten minutes to downtown and all the conventions and everything, uh, four bedrooms, three bath house. And as long as we break even or cash flow positive, then that's a huge win winner. You know, again, we'll be basically cashed out, nothing left in the property, and we still get the, the benefits of ownership. You're private lending. What, what rate are you um, I think I'm paying 12%, and I pay them three points up front. So it's expensive, mm -hmm. but it, the purpose of that is just for a short term loan, like six months, to, to buy it, set it up, fix it up, and then refi it out. Mm -hmm. So you do this all through a separate company? Um, I I have my partnership company with my father-in-law. Mm -hmm. So we set up an LLC mm -hmm. where we're joint partners. Every different property has a different bank account. So you can set that up with the portals, Airbnb. Um, we'll let you set up different bank accounts for property. Mm -hmm. And then it makes it easier for doing a P and L and property. That's interesting. So, just to be able to track your profit and loss. So you know, I, I do the I do the same thing with my flips. So if I have three flips going on at once, I need to have at least three bank accounts so that we can track the expenses on that one flip. So when it comes to tax time, we're able to see what's actually profit at the end of the day, which you know with with investments, sometimes it's not 
as clear because you have a lot of money going out before it comes back in. So it's just more important that you're able to keep track of that in those devices. Ver versus the real estate sales business where it's like, if I have money in the account, I'm doing good, right? <laughs> Sometimes, <laughs> I don't know. But you guys have any questions? I, I, I love doing this stuff. I'm really passionate about it. Are you doing like savings and a checking? Um, for, for the Airbnbs, each property has a, a checking account. And then um, we have an overall reserve account for the business. So the checking account might have that four month um, reserve for the property. And then we have an extra reserve for the business. There's an investment opportunity that comes up that we need to put earnest money out or whatever. So when you're pricing out your nightly um, charge, how do you necessarily comp that out? And I've heard from some people that start when they initially get um, involved in Airbnb, people start low to build up that rapport and low for you. Mm -hmm. So that typically a strategy? Or you do that? I, I kind of like, if there's other Airbnb, Airbnbs in the area, I'll look at those as like a comp, like you would a house, right? And see what they're going for. And then it's really easy to see your comp yeah. on Airbnb because everything's okay. right there. You can see what their occupancy is yeah. even their with their calendar. Yeah. And then I look at like a hotel, right? Like, is it like, you know, Zionsville, there's one on Brook Street. I'm like, okay, I know that. Two fifty a night, right? Like, and you get a room. So you okay. can kind of, and then it's sort of a plain thing. Okay. And then people will ask you, "Do we get discounts?" Yeah. Like, we can get a thing to this. Right? Yeah. The beginning, it is a little bit more of a shame. figuring it out. Okay. Um, doing my own research, I've heard of this website called AirDNA. Um, mm -hmm. where you can like search the code or an area, and then it'll show you all the Airbnbs in that area. Um, see what they're charging and they're waiting and everything like that. Mm -hmm. Air DNA. Yeah. Air? DNA? Mm -hmm. Really? Yeah. There's um there's a free version and there's also like what you said like monthly to see more things and get more in depth. But um yes, it's it's been really good. It's a, yeah, they're a data company. That, yeah. that's a great place to start. Mm -hmm. You know, start with Air DNA, look at Airbnb comps just to get an estimate. Do you do so, charitable rates or um, like big events or you know, more and then you know, low season and the that year rates are lower? Do you, do you do that? So I, I wanted to go through like kind of uh, a deal analyzer because I, I, I work with one of my clients. He owns, I think, 25 Airbnbs now. So he, he's been kind of a mentor to me and he put together like this cool analyzer uh, tool. But the, the way he looks at, you know, when you're reviewing a property, you're, you're thinking about doing an Airbnb. Um, he looks at high, high season and low season. So you're probably going to have a different um, average daily rate for high season versus low season. So, you know, let's say your property, you're getting 250. So this, this might be one line, but 250 in the high season and the low season, you're getting 150. And then you you can adjust what percentage of the year um, you're in high season and what percentage of the year you're in low season. So most of ours in the Midwest, I think 50% of the year, high versus low because of the seasonality. And then um, than occupancy. So this is kind of just an estimate. Um, you know, a lot of people are trying to achieve 70% occupancy, but in the low season, you might be lower, 50% occupancy. So when I put those numbers in, I get like an annual rent total, and then I break down the expenses. So like the cleaning fees, the uh, the mortgage costs, expenses, utilities, lawn care, consumables, maintenance to get an estimate for your uh, monthly cash flow. So this is 
kind of my process when I'm reviewing a property. Um, and then once I do this, I fill out his analyzer and I'll email it to him. I'll be like, hey, are my expenses in line? Do you do you think we could achieve that average daily rate based on some of the comps? What do you think about the occupancy? Am I being too aggressive? <clears throat> you know, so that before you buy the property, you can actually estimate. And it is a little harder to estimate on the short-term rentals doing this because it's so variable compared with a long-term rental where you have rent comps, um, flips where you're just doing ARV. So that but the cash flow is average or yeah, have one for yeah. each monthly for high and monthly for low. Yeah, average monthly cash flow. So, you know, when you're doing an investment, you want to know what the expected outcome is before you buy it, mm -hmm. whether you're doing a flip, long term rental, short term rental. And, you know, that's just kind of my process when I'm reviewing these, even though I'm a few of them in <laughs> work in progress, right? But having a plan going in is super important. Um, Kevin, I have a question. Yeah. So when you uh, set the property for Airbnb, right? You said like upwards will take around five thousand, uh -huh. like furnitures and probably paint and carpet or things like yeah. that. So do you shop in certain places or it's just like a random? How do I know I'm not putting in too much or putting in too much? In, in, like, in terms of repairs or furnishing. Uh, furnishings and setting up um, the expenses, like yeah. because I don't want to put in too much expenses, and then I'm thinking like, do I get it or not? Or like so that. if you're doing short-term rental, everybody's a little different with the furnishing. That that is almost the hardest part. Do you furnish your own properties? Yeah, I enjoy that part though. Yeah, the the design and picking out different pieces. Yeah, I want to hear from James because James has a totally different approach because he's like hands off on everything okay. so, <laughs> yeah. I, yeah i would love to hear like yours yeah. because we want to learn from you <laughs> Let's go. he does not get involved on that in any of it so. okay. yeah so i think shopping is about like getting <laughs> dentist so that's the last thing i want to do is yeah. and i'm um, with you james my furniture so a couple of things i want to touch on i'm going to share my screen here again um oh. Uh, there is that working? Yes. Yep. Okay. So Kevin was talking about numbers and how to uh, figure out what a property is going to bring. So I've got a property down in Florida where I'm actually at right now, um, and this was a performer that my pro property manager did, and you can see exactly what Kevin was talking about. He's got low season, shoulder season, peak season, and then holiday nights. So he estimated how many nights, uh, he said between 147 and 175 nights, which is like 45 to 50% um, occupancy. And then this is the number of nights he estimated for each season. And this was what we thought the gross rent would be. So basically exactly what Kevin said, except for I, you know, I've got a property manager that did it, um, but basically the same sort of thing. And then also, um, so Stacy asked about furnishing. So the property here in Florida, I bought it, it was fully furnished. So it was new construction and the builder furnished the house. So when we were down here looking, that was one of our stipulations. We did not want to furnish a house. Um, we didn't want to take the time or the energy to do it. So we were just looking at furnished houses, which down here, this is basically a rental um, quote unquote resort type area. It's not uncommon to buy a furnished house down here. Probably, uh, oh, I'm going to say 60 to, 70, 60 to 75 percent of the houses down here are sold furnished. So a little bit different than what we're used to up north. And then what I did, Steve was talking about cost uh, segregation earlier. So I had my builder uh, give me a separate bill for what the furniture costs. So, you know, the furniture is something that you can depreciate all in, I believe it's one year or three years or something. But he just gave me a separate invoice, you know said here's what the furniture costs so that way we can we can write that all off pretty easily um i've got another airbnb property that's in fishers and kind of the, the make a long story short i bought that house about three years ago i bought it in early 2020 um it was a long-term rental and uh 
I left the tenant in there and my plan was I would, you know, rehab the property once she moved out and she just kept renewing her lease, renewing her lease. So I raised it a couple of times. And then finally, um, I just told her I wasn't going to renew it anymore. And, and she had, you know, at that time, like 90 days to get out and Megan and I had a plan. We were going to turn it into an Airbnb property. And, you know, as I've said, I usually do things backwards. So I had no idea what I was going to, what I was doing. I had no idea how much money it would get. I just knew that, you know, I was, it was renting it for 1600. And if I rehabbed it, I thought it'd be about 1850. And I knew I could get more than that as an Airbnb. Um, that particular property was paid off. So I knew if I made several mistakes, you know, I could afford to do it on that property since I didn't have a big monthly obligation. Um, so um, I hired a company and I forget the name of it. Uh, Steve Rupp, uh, you would know. It was the lady that you had, that was going to, uh, GC that property for you yeah, let's more on. Mm -hmm. right so they also their bigger part of their business is they uh, furnish Airbnb properties and they manage them so I didn't hire them to manage it but I brought her in and said hey can you give me an estimate of what it would cost to fully furnish this house and I could pull it up I believe it was do you remember Megan it was like 21,000 or 23,000 or something yeah somewhere around right probably around 21 so, and that was fully furnished. And we're talking towels, knives, uh, toaster, um, everything like turnkey. So I, we, turned them over, we, we turned over that house. We did a complete rehab on it and we gave it to them and it was just completely empty. And it took her, what, about, about 10 days? It was super yeah, fast. Yeah, it was really wow. fast. It, it was completely I furnished. Have you for all? <laughs> <laughs> I'm more than happy to give your info. But so I gave them, I think it was half up front and then gave them the other half when they were done. The house was turnkey ready to rent. Um, it was um, just over 20,000. I just looked it up. And for me, you know, I think, and she had it broke down. I think her fee was maybe $3,000 of that. Um, and that was design fee, um, travel, all that good stuff. So for me, it was worth it to pay $3,000 because I mean, let's face it, if I had to do it, I would still be out buying stuff. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's a lot they, of work. Yeah, it's a heck of a lot of work. They even they stock soap, uh, shampoo, laundry detergent. I mean, it was literally fully furnished, ready to go. So that's that's the route I went and it worked well. Um, I I've made a lot of mistakes with that property, and I can pull it back up here. Uh, let's see. Let me get back to the screen share. I have a, I have a question for you and Stacy. Do do you guys stock cleaning supplies for your cleaners at the property? Uh, uh, I do, and then they just I come in. Yeah, cool. I I do too. I was just curious if that's what other people do. So on this property, so I didn't know what to charge in rent. So I asked her and like an idiot, I didn't really listen. I thought, oh, she's, that's way too high. So um, this, as you can see, this is what I'm getting per month. Uh, April, we're at almost $4,000. Um, and this has been my best month, best month so far. So nice. where I say I made the biggest mistake, um, when I first got it, I had the rate set too low and I had the calendar to where it went all the way out. Um, I believe it was six months, maybe a year out. So it was like the first people that booked, and this was back in October of last year. So they booked it way out for summer of this year. And I was like, that's awesome. I'm getting bookings that far out. Well, the yeah, reason- You're underpriced, was, right? <laughs> underpriced. And not only that, you know, it was underpriced and it was peak season. So I could have charged yeah. even more than what my base was. And but I say that- is, um his uh, cancellation on like the most lenient too. I think they got all their money back. It's like, no. <laughs> yeah, we changed that real quick. But I think I started in September of 2022. Wait. Nope, October, October yeah. of 2022. Yes. And as you can see, the first month I got almost three grand. Um, like I said, as a, as a long-term rental, it would be about 1800 a month. Yeah. Um, November was, why is that not? I don't know why that's not showing up the amount, but November was about $2,400. That was the worst month I've had. December was over 3,000. And then going into 2023, 
um, you know, we've been over 3000 every month. Nice. So that it's, it's worked out really well so far. Um, and I can, he does that himself. Uh, let's see, where do I want to go? So here's here's the property like right around um, Top Golf. So there's like a neighborhood back kind of yeah. around there. Is that sandstone? No, it's north of sandstone. It's um, I I can't even think of what it's called. Um, <laughs> pictures, listing basics. EV friendly. Did you did you install an EV charging station? Yes. So mm -hmm. Catherine uh, on my team had an extra one. <laughs> And oh. she, <laughs> so, yeah. and people have been using it so these are the pictures of the property yeah it looks beautiful wow. i mean just beautiful now luckily for me i've got two good people megan um did all the rehab work you know she picked out all the appliances i did not personally do the work <laughs> just <laughs> that. you did a really good job that is phenomenal thank you but we did a total re rehab on the range. <laughs> here, here. <laughs> I'll take it. <laughs> I hear you. So this house, it had a, a tub right here where the shower is. And we took the tub out and put this big tile shower in. That is beautiful. Um, I think that's kind of what gets us the most, you know, uh activity on the property how much did you put into the, the rehab not the first that's a great question i got you <laughs> um yeah that was like 60 grand um but we had to do we did a concrete patio as well and, and that, that was not, that was not too right what did that include furnishing it no. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, the concrete like pad itself was like over five grand to do that. Um, and we had to get rid of that tree. There was a big tree. Yeah, we had to do a big tree removal oh. because it wasn't like safe. And so, yeah, there were a lot of things that we didn't really initially anticipate. With that subway tile in the mm -hmm. bathroom is so classic and easy to do, but it really pops. Mm -hmm. yeah. We we spend a lot more money rehabbing that property than we usually do. We put nicer cabinets. Yes. Um, we, we put nicer for everything there. Yeah, we did nicer flooring and we did the LVP throughout the the, the whole house. Um, I bought that house really cheap. I bought it for about one hundred and seventy thousand. I think it was. That's probably on there too, isn't it, Megan? Yeah, one seventy two. One seventy two. So. You know, I knew I could afford to put a little bit more money into it because it, the ARV on that one's probably in the neighborhood of three, maybe three twenty. Yeah. Uh, so it's definitely, definitely being a good one. But we knew, you know, with it being paid off and that I bought it so cheap, I knew there was plenty of money in there to to play around with um, for errors. So it's it's turned out to be pretty good. And like I said, so Kevin was talking about your your objective. So that property, um, it's all cash flow because it's paid off. So I like to have a mix of cash flow and, and equity creating properties. Uh, the one I'm at right now down here in Florida, this one, it cash flows, but not a lot. Um, but at the same time, I gained 300K in equity in the last last year. So wow. it's kind of, you know, it's it's cash flow and I'm not putting money into it, um, but it's it's more of an equity thing. Um, we bought this one so because we we love coming down here. We wanted a place where we could vacation, but I'm, uh, as my wife likes to say, I'm cheap. So you know I don't want to pay the rates that it costs down here to come. And then also when I rent, my my wife fired me from renting places because they're usually <laughs> not up to her standards. <laughs> so this was kind of a way to make everyone happy because. You know, I'm happy on the financial side and she's happy because of where we're staying. So, right. like I said, we don't cash flow a lot of money on this one, but it's more about the equity and, and free or reduced cost vacations. Yeah. So so can the three of you kind of talk to us a little bit about some of the some of the bigger ticket furnishing items that you would recommend putting? Uh, I think somebody mentioned granite versus maybe laminate, for example, or do you recommend putting all LVP in so you don't have carpet to get dirty or 
whatever. What are some of the furnishings that you would say, <clears throat> do this, don't do this? I think LVP. I, I like LVP because you can't, it's, it's indestructible. Yeah. Um, you know, I don't allow pets, but sometimes people bring pets when they're not supposed to. Um, you just, they just do. Um, and carpet, especially in a rental property, people probably aren't going to take off their shoes, nor should they have to. If they're paying a lot of money, they should do what they want to do. Um, but LVP, you can't destroy it. And we put LVP in that whole house because, you know, in five years, it should look as good as it looks today. Um, same, this property down here in Florida, there's, which, you know, Florida is a little different, but there's, it's all hard surfaces as well. So it's kind of, kind of hard to tear up. Um, but I think I think it's just like buying a house, kitchens and baths. I, I think when people go on vacation or if they're just going to stay somewhere, um, they want something that's the same level as what they have or nicer. And when you're sitting up in, in bed at midnight looking through Airbnb for a property and you see one that has, you know, just a nice looking bathroom or nice looking kitchens, you're going to spend an extra 25 bucks or 40 bucks or whatever it is a night to get that place over one that that doesn't at least in my opinion and i can bring up pictures for um i'll show the pictures for the the place down here if i can find it hey hey james uh i'm just curious what what's your management fee for the uh the 20%. floor back 20 percent Yep. Yeah, so short-term rentals, you're going to pay a higher management fee, usually 20 to 30 percent versus long-term rentals, you might pay eight to ten. So, like, is is my screen share working? Yeah. So the place down here, this is this is yeah, a picture of it. It's gorgeous. And we kind of thank you. So kind of what we did, we made it the way, or we bought it, and then we added the things that we want when we're here, and we just assume, you know, we're a family of four. And that seems to be the demographic of people that come down here, a family of four or five or six, whatever they have. But we figured the things that we like to do, others will like. So my property manager, holy cow. So my property manager included the bikes. Um, they're, so they're building another house around the corner and they're putting the pilings in and it shook the whole house. <laughs> oh, oh, it might be a loss. <laughs> that's going to be expensive, James. I thought we'd get a shot up there for a minute. But uh, <laughs> so my property manager provides the bikes. So anybody that rents it's allowed to use the bikes. Cool. Um, and then um, I bought a golf cart, as you can see. So this is a whole golf cart friendly area. So we've got a six passenger golf cart people that rent it can use. Do you uh, have any extra liability concerning that using that equipment and? The golf cart. Yeah, the golf cart kind of scares me a little bit. Um, so I have a, a separate insurance policy for it. Um, but it, I mean, you know, I'm sure one day when someone gets killed on it, I'll get sued. Something bad's going to happen one of these days. But so this house is, it's a four bedroom, uh, three and a half bath. And what we wanted, we wanted, we wanted to make sure we had a main floor master. And uh, we wanted that for a couple of reasons. One, because I don't like going upstairs. And two, we just figured, you know, if you come down here with grandma and grandpa, it's nice to have a main floor master for them to stay at. So like right now down here, it's just my mom and I, and this is the master bedroom here. So she's there. And that fuzzy rug is huge. <laughs> Actually, my wife and I didn't like that. We thought it was getting dirt. So we pulled that out. We came down here in February and we pulled that rug. <laughs> okay. So, um, yeah, so she's, you know, it's nice that they don't have to go up and down steps. So that was one of our requirements. Um, cool. He's got the wet room in here. Cabinet lighting? Yeah, it's got under cabinet lighting and all the baths. Wow. And, and the tub in the shower, that's, the that's shower. pretty unique. The wet room. Mm -hmm. yeah. Do you feel like there's projections? And I think you said they have a projection of 132. That's a great question. Um, so <laughs> our, proje the projection was 132. This is uh, right here is where I'm sitting right now. Okay. So our projection for the year was 132. And last we've, we've been at it just over 12 months and we hit about 105. Okay. Um, so we fell short of our projection. Um, but we used the property about eight weeks last year. 
Wow, that's a lot. That is a lot. So, so I figured in, I averaged out those numbers or those nights that we stayed. And if we would have gotten our average rent for those nights, it would put us right at 125. <laughs> James, do you deduct your cost to go down there then? Um, I do sometimes. I don't do it every time. Um, so like this trip I did um, because um, for this trip, there we added a patio. Let me get to the picture here. So the backyard right here. So we've got this patio and there's four chairs and a fire pit. So yesterday we added or we extended the size of this patio. We had to pop out a couple trees. And they basically tripled the size of the patio. And then today in about an hour, I've got a table and some chairs coming. So we wanted to have a place where you can eat outside. Mm -hmm. So we just added that. And so I felt as though I was down here to oversee that. So I yeah. decided. <laughs> That's a community pool. The community pool. And then this is a lake. So the back of the neighborhood, this is a, a lake that connects out to the golf. So you can walk through the neighborhood. This is directly behind the pool, which is about a block away from my house. So we can walk to the pool and then go out to that dock and you can paddleboard all the way out to the golf uh, from the neighborhood, oh. which is kind of cool. Uh, I'm this, for a night, James, in, let's say in the summer. Uh, last year, the best we did, we got like nine, 10 a night. Wow. So we've we've gotten anywhere from like 350 a night in the winter to a little over 900 in the summer. Wow. Is that, what about your, is this like a hot spring break area or not? Uh, spring break, fall break, and summer. Summer's the busiest time. That's your highest rate. And then spring break and fall break are, are a little bit less. So, so summer we're getting, you know, 800 to 900 a night. Spring break and fall break mm -hmm. are about 700 to 800 a night. And then uh, winter. So we just we just booked somebody for two months a couple of weeks ago. They're going to come mid January and leave mid March. And I think we got about three fifty a night. Wow, that was very unexpected. Because this, I mean, I don't know if you geographically. This, I mean, this is this is not South Florida. This is the Panhandle. So the the true snowbirds. You know, if you want 80, 75, 80 degrees in the winter, you're going to Naples or Fort Myers or something. So I'm not 100% sure why somebody wanted to book this for two months in the winter, but I didn't argue. <laughs> it's, it's what, 10 grand a month? Uh, it was. Um, I can't about to pay out of that. What's it? Right. I can find it real quick if you got a second. So would you recommend people investing in Airbnbs down in Florida? Clearly, there's some differences between doing them up down there and up here. Yeah. I absolutely I think you just got to have it's a little different um you know a little different mindset so one especially now it's very hard to cash flow um down here so like I said our so um we rented it for 40 49 nights it's from January 20th through March 9th and it was 344 a night so it grossed uh 16,874 dollars nice nice That's so great. it's so, and I said earlier that our house has appreciated uh, 300,000. So we, we paid a, a million 350 and um, I got wind. I, I kind of keep track of the, the market down here as much as I do up North, or at least I try to. So I got wind of a house that sold a couple blocks away uh, a couple of months ago and they got a million eight for it. So I called the realtor <laughs> and uh, cause I, I got wind that her buyer was wanting to buy another house in the neighborhood. So I just, I found out who the realtor was and I just called her up and said, Hey, I heard you sold, you know, 18 inlet Heights for a million eight. Um, I live at 151 Grand Point and I heard they're wanting to buy another house. If they paid one eight for that, do you want to see what they would pay for mine? And she said, sure. So I connected her with my property manager. They walked through the house and two weeks ago, they gave us an offer of a million six fifty. So we did not take it. Um, we decided to, you know, we it's paying for it's doing what we intended so we're going to keep it and and hopefully we didn't make a mistake there um believe me that took a, a long weekend of <laughs> my wife and i make but, it a million seven fifty and we have a deal yeah. <laughs> oh we we countered them at a million say they came in at a million six we counted them a million seven and they came back at a million six fifty yeah so that's kind of 
So I feel like that's a, a pretty true market number since it was right. an actual offer and not, you know, an appraisal or his estimate. But um, like I said, it doesn't cash flow like things do in Indiana, but you don't get appreciation like that, like you do, you know, you don't get appreciation like that in Indiana. The only, because we've added no value. I mean, this was literally new construction. So it's not like, you know, we remodeled this or did that. This is just what it's done on its own. Um, and the funny part is we actually bought this house sight unseen um, when we bought it. And Stacy, you probably remember. Um, yeah, it was neat too, like crazy that it appreciated that much. Yeah, I, I had no idea that was going to happen. Um, when we bought this, it was still under construction. And we didn't even look at houses in this neighborhood. We didn't go this far down on 38. Um, sorry about that. When we were looking. And we put an offer on a house when we were down here, we didn't get it. We went back home, put an offer on another house, didn't get it. And then we found this neighborhood, you know, and this, there's a couple, there's, it's a small neighborhood. There's probably a hundred houses and there's about four or five custom builders that are building in here. And this one wasn't even listed yet. Um, the builder was getting ready to list it. And we just, we kind of got wind of it from my property manager and my realtor down here did a couple of walkthroughs, did some drive rounds for us and I mean we kind of ran her to death for a couple of weeks and we put an offer on it and they accepted it and then about two or three weeks later we were able to drive down for a weekend and see it and still when we saw it it still wasn't done um it was the cabinets were in that was kind of those cabinets were in and they were painting um so we had a pretty good idea of what it was going to look like and then we just found some other properties that the builder had built that were furnished and you know they they had told us that it was going to be the same designer that was going to furnish it and they said hey yeah it's going to be furnished exactly like you know one two three green street you know in a similar fashion and we were like well we like that house so as long as it's going to be like that we're good with it so we had absolutely no input on the furnishings which gave my wife a lot of anxiety okay. um but it turned out, you know, it turned out way better than, don't tell her I said this, but it turned out way better than what she, pro, you know, what, what we could have done, especially being 750 miles away. So, uh, James, who is the builder? Is it okay to ask? The, the builder, it's, it's called Focus Construction. They're based out of Panama City. Okay. Hmm. They've got, he's got three more houses in the neighborhood under construction right now. Oh, yes. For a PL standpoint, then what are you looking like? Is there are you reporting income on that this year then or no? Yeah, so we um my expenses are about fifty eight hundred dollars a month, and that's that's mortgage, um, right. lawn care, that's that's everything. So we're uh, about seventy thousand is kind of where we need to be. And like I said, we grossed about 105, and then the property manager gets 20%. Yeah. So we it was like 84. So we we cash flowed. I think it was like ten, twelve thousand dollars. I mean, it, it wasn't much. And, yeah, but for first year and yeah. Right, and we've noticed. So the things we booked so far this year are um, bookings are up um, as far as rate about ten percent over last year, and then also so our occupancy last year was right at like forty eight percent. So my goal for this year, I want to get our rate up about ten percent and get our our, our occupancy up to about fifty five percent. Yeah, and still, we still plan to use it yeah. about seven or eight weeks. What about HOA? Any um, pushback on Airbnb the way they're up here? So that's a good question. So a lot of neighborhoods down here, uh, there's a lot of, of, of Airbnb. So my neighborhood, um, there's about 65% of the houses down here are full-time residents or second homes. And about 30 to 35 percent are short-term rentals, which is um, one of the reasons why we like it because it's a little quieter than a lot of neighborhoods down here. I don't know who all's been down to 30A. I know Stacy's been down here a lot, but I mean during summer and spring break, this is a very, very busy, very congested place. And my wife and I like the idea that it, it feels like a regular neighborhood versus just a rental neighborhood, even though there's there are several rentals here. Um, we've gotten, there's, there's kind of a, a mini war in our neighborhood between the long-term residents and the short-term 
um, Airbnb people. So um, we, we've gotten, we probably had, I think two or three fines last year. Uh, we had a fine, if, if like the trash picks up twice a week here and if your trash is out, like, you know, if you don't get your trash can in within, it seems like two seconds of the time, <laughs> <laughs> they will find you because we got a couple of fines last year. Um, sometimes when people are renting it, they, so we've got a two car garage, which is full between our golf cart and the bikes. And we got all kinds of beach equipment in there. Um, so you can't really use the garage and the driveway is good for two cars. So sometimes people will rent it and they may have three cars and you're not supposed to park um, on the street. Sometimes people do. And I got fined once for that. So I just put in the budget this year, I think $250 for fines. And if we get them, we get them. If we don't, great. <laughs> but we've never, we've, we've never had any damage. Um, we had, we had a table get damaged once. Um, and the people just paid for it and, and my property manager replaced it. Um, the one in Fishers, I had a lamp get busted once and the people there told me about it and just asked me how much it was. And I told them and they, you know, they sent me the money. So I've never really had any issues. Um, I'm sure we will one day soon, but we haven't really had any issues yet with either one of them. What about HOA in your Fisher's neighborhood? Now, Indiana, um, all the neighborhoods are looking at. They are. Yeah, so, they're not they're not like yeah I know Megan looked into that before we decided to um, swap it into. I, I've had, so I had the next door neighbor call me once saying that he thought the people were having a party and he could smell marijuana. Um, I just, I, I, you know, I told him I was sorry and told him he should have asked if they wanted to share. But I mean, <laughs> you know, but other than that, you know, it's it, I, that one's been an Airbnb since September or October, whatever it was. So I, I feel like even if you have a long term renter, rental, you're going to have a call here or there. Yeah. So if I get one call, that's no big deal. I'm talking about banning them. Um, like I know a couple neighborhoods have a HOAs have voted that. You have to own the property for five years before you can rent it, or no Airbnbs. Um, a lot of neighborhoods, My especially in the side, say that. But you own it in long term. Yeah. yeah. We we checked this neighborhood, the one in Fishers, before we turned it into an Airbnb, and so it, it was okay there. If they change it, I, I don't think they can. I think they kind of have to grandfather you in, which yeah. selfishly. Um, if they did that now, it'd be fine because it'd probably give me a way to jack the rates up because Airbnbs are popping up pretty frequently. So, you know, if they, I would like to get about three or four more of them and then they don't allow any more at all. So I'm sure it's not going to happen like that, but I haven't had any issues. Um, we're kind of looking, so I've got another property in Westfield now and that tenant moves out at the end of June. And so that's our next project. We're going to turn it into an Airbnb because the first one has done so well. I think, I don't know this for sure, but I was told that in Carmel, you have to apply for an Airbnb permit and it could take you up to a year to get that. Yeah, Carmel's, that's what, yeah, Carmel's, I don't even look in Carmel. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm looking, so if I could find an, I wanna find a four bedroom house in Westfield or Fishers. Um, I've been looking for this for like a year and you know I'm pretty cheap on my my price range, which has been the, the problem the problem is is you know you got once you rehab it it's going to be 40 to 50 grand to do the rehab and furnish it so you know i'm just factoring that into my price yeah so i'll find one but it, it may take me another three months or six months but making the one friends with your neighbors though especially with the short-term rentals is a huge huge advantage like uh, on my downtown noblesville property my one neighbor does the lawn care Oh. Yeah, and and I'm friends with the neighbor across the street because they talk with everybody. So like one time I I got a message that you know the the tenant was disrespectful to them, and uh, then I got another call that they wanted to sell their house, and then they decided not to sell their house. And now they're getting a real estate license. <laughs> I'm like I love these neighbors, <laughs> but yeah, you you definitely get some intel knowing your neighbors. Mm -hmm. making friends with them instead of it just being like oh they're that's the rental house i agree 
Yeah, I had on on the Fisher's ha- property. I had the next door neighbor uh, ask me if if her daughter could stay in it like last year over Christmas time. Cool. So nice. it's yeah, make friends with them and might make some money. Usually the listing listing agent or the you know the listing agent probably knows whether there's rental restrictions. The so the owner, are all like, like like if there's the rental restrictions, you're not gonna allow short term rentals. So just find out about rental restrictions. So there's a number, like I know like our neighborhood was trying to limit by a number and you live there for so long. Like Royal Run, I know, has like a they've set a percentage of the neighborhood now yeah. that can be uh rental. So yeah. there are, I think that. The neighborhoods are starting, and I think they've all gotten the same attorney advice, and they're all like, you know, no rental. But then if you want to rent your own property to get permission, I'm like, my house. So. Right. <laughs> yeah. It's fine. All right. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Stacy Thank and Kevin. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'll be back in town tomorrow. You're all right. See ya. Hey, guys. Bye.